come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. And perhaps you've come to look upon me as the master of the macabre, your escort into the eerie. And in all honesty, I can say that I am happy you have this opinion of me. I'll admit to an affinity for tales of the supernatural and even a sneaking fondness for ghosts. Some ghosts, that is. I cannot say that I have liked every ghost I have met because in my experience, there can be some very unpleasant ghosts. Our mystery drama, Voices of Death, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Murray Burnett and stars Mandel Kramer and Ralph Bell. It is sponsored in part by Sinoff, the Sinus Medicines, and Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Hello, Ms. Goldilocks here, and welcome to my professional taste-testing laboratory. Oh, Papa Bear, Mm -hmm. could you bring that case of sugar-free Diet 7-Up over here? Another case? Ms. Goldilocks, you're drinking the sugar-free Diet 7-Up like there's no tomorrow. You can't still be taste-testing it. Oh, no, Papa Bear. Sugar-free Diet 7-Up has already earned my seal of approval. It's fresh, light, natural. Delicious. I drink it because I love its taste. Now hurry up. Okay, okay, here. Mm-hmm. This sugar-free diet 7-Up really tastes delicious. Ladies, if you're tired of switching from one diet drink to another, take some advice from Ms. Goldilocks. Try sugar-free diet 7-Up and you'll say, yes, this one's just right. I'll bear witness to that, Goldie. <laughs> Instead of working your money up the savings ladder, why not start your savings right at the top with Suburban Savings 7.50% savings certificates? Suburban Savings in North Jersey is paying a top 7.90% effective yield on all new 7.50 savings certificates, and Suburban guarantees it for 4 to 10 years. A $2,500 minimum is all you need to get started at the top. Suburban Savings compounds interest from day of deposit paid quarterly. So you get not only interest on your savings, you get interest on interest. Early withdrawal prior to maturity is subject to a substantial penalty. Start your savings at the top, earning a top 7.90% effective annual yield at any of Suburban's offices in Bayonne, Edgewater, Elmwood Park, Emerson, Hackettstown, Morris Plains, Nutley, Paramus, and Sparta. many stories about faceless voices that speak to lonely people. Voices that come from nowhere, that threaten, cajole, terrify, or madden the mortals who hear them. Our story is about such a voice, but it is a voice that has a face, the face of a dead man. Most of us know what to expect when we turn on a television set. But the last thing Jason Phillips expected was to have the face of a dead man appear on his television tube. How did the face of Peter Truro get on my TV screen? Peter, I'm sure if you were alive, you'd understand why yours is the last face I'd want to look at. So forgive me for switching stations. What is this, Peter again? I'll try another channel. On every channel? Peter Truro? That's ridiculous. And no sound. What's wrong with the sound? Nothing, Jason. What? This isn't the normal way to return. Well, I'm seeing things. And hearing them. Peter Truro is dead and buried. He couldn't be talking to me from my TV screen. Everything... Everything happened so suddenly with Peter and Claire and that lousy Lindvilla. Put the TV back on. Relax, Jason. I'm not a delusion. I realize I might talking to you this way must be quite a shock, but uh, you're really seeing and talking with Peter Truro. Oh, sure. Sure. Peter Truro, who's been dead and cremated for ten days. The body, yes, Jason, but uh, nothing else. Now, just as soon as we complete our business, you'll be rid of me. And you'll be happy. You keep talking about business... What kind of business can we have? You're going to do a little job for me, Jason. 
you're going to kill my wife. There's absolutely no point in your turning off the television, Jason. You're a fraud, Peter. I don't know how you got into my set, but you're a fraud. Oh, come on now. You're not going to claim that you're still upset because, after all, I am a ghost? Well, of course. It's a perfectly natural occurrence, isn't it? Everyone who watches television sooner or later finds himself face-to-face and talking with a ghost every time he turns on his set. What you're really telling me is that you're afraid I'm not a ghost at all, but a figment of your imagination. And you find that strange... You don't think that that's enough to upset me? Of course. Of course it is, Jason. Like Hamlet, you're wondering about your brain. Yes, I am. Well, I can take that worry off your shoulders. Oh. Suppose Claire comes to see you. Claire? What would she want? An attack of conscience. Guilt. Whatever you may want to call it. But, Jason, I will make Claire visit you. And then we will talk again. What in the world am I doing here anyway? Can you tell me, Jason? Putting on a marvelous act as usual, Claire. Why do I feel cold? Why do I have this feeling that Peter's watching? (laughs) Which question would you like me to answer? Do you believe in ghosts? Of course not. Well, you sound so sure. So very. And you're not. I remember how you used to make fun of the whole spiritual scene. I said it was impossible. Claire, why this discussion? What made you phone me and come here to talk about... I've been having dreams. Dreams? Well, I'm no psychiatrist. Yes, dreams about Peter. He keeps telling me to come to you and explain about... Well, you know, how you lost the part in the play and... I'm not making very much sense, am I? No, you're not. I don't know why you came here, but I know damn well you'd better leave. Are you convinced, Jason? Do you believe now that I'm a ghost? Well, you heard Claire. You know I sent her to you. So she says. I don't know whether it was smart to throw her out so abruptly. She may become suspicious. About what? About your wanting to kill her. You're out of your mind. You're crazy. Remember how you felt when Claire told you that she was replacing you in the part that I had picked for you in Cries of Descent? Remember how you raged because you knew that Claire was throwing you out, not because of your lack of ability, but because she wanted the part for her lover, Edward Linville. You even threatened to kill her. I don't have to listen to any more of this. Right now, I could cheerfully have murdered you if you'd been alive. Hello. Jason, this is Claire. Darling, I do think you owe me some sort of explanation for almost throwing me out of your place a while ago. Claire, my love, the only thing I owe you is a punch in the mouth, and if you were a man, I'd be happy to give it to you. Are you going to be with us long, Mr. Phillips? Well, that depends. You'll find all sports and great weather at the Clarkstown Inn. Uh, You will be in 445. If there's anything you want, don't hesitate to ask. Now, before I call a leader, I think I'd better see if Peter is still with me. Here I am, Jason. You didn't think you could run away from me, did you? I wasn't sure, but I was hoping. I'm curious about one thing. Why did you pick this godforsaken little town as a place of refuge? Because I happen to have been born right here in Clarkstown. Ah. Then this is an attempt to recapture the safety of your childhood. That's very touching, Jason. I've had enough of you tonight, Peter. Time for me to do what I came here for in the first place. Talk to an old friend. Hello? Alita, what a delight to hear your voice after all these years. And it is a pleasure to hear yours, Jason. Oh, Alita, you're too much. After all these years, you hear me say your name and immediately you know my voice. It is a distinctive voice, Jason. Are you calling from New York? No. I'm at the inn right here in Clarkstown. Matter of fact, I came here just to see you. How nice. But, Jason, there's been a lot of years since we last spoke. And right now it's almost past my bedtime. How about breakfast with me tomorrow? More coffee, Jason. No, thanks, Alita. Alita, I'm being haunted. I think I'm going crazy. I don't know where to turn or what to do. 
That's why I came to see you. Do you think you can help me? If you'll calm down, maybe. Well, you just don't know what it's like. And I can't find out unless you tell me. Do you know this ghost? Of course. It's the famous Broadway producer, Peter Truro. Hmm. I read about his death. It was only a short time ago. That's right. And he's been after me for the past two weeks. How does this haunting manifest itself? Through television. Hmm. Every time I turn on a TV set, it's Peter's face that appears. I can't get any other programs, just Peter Truro. Hmm. What does he say to you? Well, that's what's got me scared. He's asking me to kill his wife. <gasps> what frightened you, Alita? Why? Well, Jason, as I remember you, when you were a boy, you were not particularly psychic or even sympathetic to psychic phenomena. That's right. In order to help you, I must find out why the ghost of Peter Truro chose you as his instrument in the first place. Can you? I can try. But not this morning. Can you come back tonight for another seance? Like the one you remembered as a boy. That's why I came. I'll be here, Alita. I can't promise anything will come out of this. I can't even promise to make contact. But if I do, you will have to keep absolutely quiet. Understand? Yes. Yes, I do. All right. Now, hold my hands. Tighter. Yes, that's it. The light is too bright. It hurts my eyes. I can't see. Ah. Better, yes. That's better. Now, I see. I see you quite clearly. Jason. Jason, why did you do this? Just when we two were getting along so well, you went and brought this stranger in. Well, Peter, I... Jason, you must keep quiet. You promised. Let him talk for himself. We have some wonderful chats when we're alone. Jason is a friend of mine. He has asked my help. Why did you choose him to torment? It is I who am in torment. You must know that. It is I who cannot rest until a vow has been kept. What vow? The marriage vow. Has it not been kept? Did you not plight love till death do us part? No. Our vow was to remain faithful and loving forever. We changed the marriage ceremony. And the vow has not been kept. And I seek revenge. I will have revenge. I will. <sighs> Alita. Alita, are you all right? Yes. Yes, I will be fine. Just give me a moment. You sure you're going to be all right? Yes, I... I am sure about me. But I am worried about you, Jason. I am not sure about you. Ghosts are very much like UFOs. People say they don't exist. But somehow, the idea of ghosts and UFOs just won't go away. It took me 20 years to get what I've got today. A nice house, a couple of comfortable, good-looking cars. Then along came all the concern about miles per gallon. They say one of my cars ought to be a small car. I say, okay, show me a small car that's good enough to make a big car guy like me happy. They say, look at a Buick. I say, go on, Buick doesn't even make small cars. Look at the Apollo, they say. So I looked. Buick does make a small car. But this one's got some room and comfort. And something else. A six-cylinder engine and a standard 21-gallon gas tank. Put those together and you've got range. Well, that's just important to me is miles per gallon. So I consider everything about the car, the economy, naturally. But also how nice it was inside and how smooth it was. And I bought the Apollo. There's nothing wrong with a small car. As long as it's a Buick. Apollo, the Buick of small cars. Hey, ma'am, what's for dinner? Hey, ma'am, what you got? Here's ShopRite's suggestion for a delightful cookout dish. Boneless top round to sirloin tip steaks, just $1.69 a pound. Delicious cooked over the coals, just as delicious pan broiled indoors. 
For a busy night, here's a quick dinner idea. Freezer Queen family size frozen casseroles, all varieties except beef, just 99 cents for the two-pound size at ShopRite. For dessert, Pepperidge Farm Layer Cake, 17-ounce box, 69 cents in ShopRite's frozen food case. Cooking out or cooking in, ShopRite has the answer. She loves the family. She wants the best. She does all that she can do. She lets ShopRite do the rest. Hey, Ma, what's for dinner? ShopRite has the answer. This is WOR New York and RKO General Station. The question of whether ghosts can have anything to do with dreams is one that has occupied the thoughts of psychics since people first began to talk about ghosts. Jason Phillips was haunted by a ghost, not in his dreams, but one who took over his TV set. Jason is seeking help, not from an analyst, but from an old and respected medium whom he had known since childhood. All right, all right, Alita. I don't mean to start a discussion. All I want to know is how do I get rid of the ghost of Peter Truro? I wish I could tell you. You mean I can't get any help? I'll have to spend the rest of my life listening to Peter insisting that I kill Claire for him? You can turn off your television, can't you? Oh, great. I'll never look at a TV set again. Is that your solution? How deeply was Peter devoted to his wife? What kind of question is that? A very important question. Well, there was a jealousy act that Peter was putting on. What made you think it was, as you put it, an act? Because nobody could have been that jealous. What about the relationship? Was it a good one? I don't know. I never stopped to think about it. There was the difference in age. I mean, Peter was some 18 years older than Claire, and he was Broadway's outstanding producer, and she was an actress. Are you trying to say that Claire married Truro to advance her career? That she didn't love him? Well, there was no question that Truro worshipped Claire, that he'd do anything for her. She liked Peter, but... Well, I think the feeling was deeper on his side than hers. And how did you feel about Claire? Alita, I don't see the point of all this. Ghosts? Do not choose people to haunt unless by design. In order even to begin to help you, we must try to find out why Peter Truro chose you as an instrument for his vengeance. How do you feel about Claire? Well, I'm certainly not fond of her. After all, she was responsible for my losing the part in Cries of Descent. You wanted to kill her. Don't be ridiculous. You sound just like Peter. You won't admit it to yourself. But you're secretly delighted with the idea of punishing Claire Truro. And there is no way you can get rid of Peter Truro until you do. Welcome home, Jason. So nice to be back with you. Cut it, Peter. I liked your friend Alida. Oh, I'm glad. Well, now that your investigation has proved that I'm really a ghost and not something your imagination cooked up... We can get down to specifics about killing Claire. Now, let's get this straight. I evidently can't stop you from appearing on my TV screen. But I am not going to kill anyone. Not even Claire. I'll show you how you can get away with it. I'm not interested. What can you lose by sitting down and picking up a piece of paper and a pen? I don't know. Admit you're curious. All right, I'm curious. Oh, come on, Jason. You know we both burn for revenge. You because Claire fired you from cries of dissent to replace you with her lover, Edward Linville. Who is awful. Have you seen him? Oh, I don't have to. I know he's terrible. But he's playing the part. And he's sleeping with my wife. So, uh, get the paper and pen, eh? All right. Now, write the following. My darling, this should not come as a surprise since we talked about your unfaithfulness. Now, wait a minute, Peter. There's not much more. Unfaithfulness many times. And you know that I said I would kill you. My dearest... Prepare to die. And sign it, Peter. 
What do you think she'll say when she finds that in her desk drawer? Hmm? Well, I think she'll laugh because she'll know it's an obvious forgery. Well, take another look, Jason. And then tell me if you recognize the writing. What? How did you do it? This is your handwriting. Please, please, Edward, don't make me look again. Darling, you must. This thing has gone too far for you to give in to it now. Now, please open the drawer. What if I find another of those horrible notes? You won't find any more. I've had the only key to the drawer in my pocket for the past two days. Oh, can't we just let it go for now? Open the drawer. Now, here's the key, darling. What was it? Another note. Another one. Well, that's impossible. Let me see. No, don't. It's impossible, you said. Impossible. All right, Edward, read what it says. Read it. Tell me it's impossible. I think we should go to the police. And tell them what? That you're getting notes from a dead man? Well, haven't you been telling me all along that that was impossible? Of course I have. Then we could go to the police and tell him that some vicious practical joker is blackmailing me. He hasn't asked for anything. Oh, he's building up to it. I know he's building up to it. Who is he? That's the big question. Who is doing this and how? I'll swear that the notes are in Peter's handwriting. And any handwriting expert will swear to the same thing. Then maybe we should ask the police to begin looking for a master forger? I thought you said we shouldn't go to the police. Well, I have an idea. Now, it may be crazy and... Well, I don't know whether or not it'll help, but it's an idea. I'll do anything, anything to stop this nonsense. Well, maybe we should find a spiritualist and have a consultation. Who is it? Ed Linville. Well, if I say I'm surprised, I'm sure you'll understand. Completely. And I'm... Sure that you'll understand that I wouldn't be here in your apartment unless I thought it was very important. Granted. I'm here because I can't help feeling there's some connection between you and some crazy notes Claire's been getting. Notes? Don't think I understand. Uh, somebody has started a systematic campaign of persecution against Claire. Well, why don't you go to the police? Because I'm afraid of the publicity. Claire will look silly because the persecution is seemingly directed by Peter Truro. Well, she can't be serious. How could Peter... That's possibly... what everyone's reaction is, because I can't explain the notes. That's the second time you've mentioned notes. They're vicious, handwritten little jottings, all reminding her of some silly vows that she had made with Truro before they were married. And they threaten her life. They're all signed by Peter Truro. Well, it's impossible. That's what I said. Claire insists that the handwriting is Peter's. It's been checked by three handwriting experts. All three say Claire's right. The handwriting is Peter's. Well, that still doesn't explain what brings you here to see me. I told you, Claire's sense there's a connection. Well, she told me she came to see you. Yes, she did. And she told me you behaved rather strangely. Look, I know you're worried about Claire, so I'm giving you a lot of latitude, but you're really beginning to annoy me, Linville. I'm just trying to find out why you got so angry with her when she was only talking about her dreams. She came here, I thought, to ask my forgiveness for the raw deal she gave me in cries of dissent. A deal which you were part of. Now, why should I sympathize with Claire and her problems? We were never that close before Peter died. And as far as you're concerned... Can you forget that I replaced you? You don't have a right to ask me to forget. Oh, yes, I have. And I'm going to get some answers, or the cops are going to get some information. Even if it means bad publicity. The cops? Claire and I went to a medium. We showed her the notes. We told her all we knew. She held a seance and she came up with your name. And that's what you're going to tell the cops that and the fact that you're mad because I replaced you in cries of dissent. You've had this coming and now you're going to get it. Oh, oh. I'll fool oh. you. So help me or I'll oh. kill you. So, Jason... We made quite a spectacle of ourselves with Edward Linville, didn't we? How did that medium get my name? She must have been extraordinarily perceptive. You know that it was a she. You're in on this. Oh, really, Jason, you're becoming paranoid. 
Since I'm obviously depending on you to kill Claire for me, it would be extraordinarily stupid for me to have you suspected even before the crime. Nobody is going to be suspected because there isn't going to be any crime. Oh, your adrenaline's still working overtime because of that scrap with Linville. When you calm down, you'll realize what a fool you're making of yourself. No need to remind me. I realized that the minute Linville said he'd been given my name. What story can Linville take to the police? He can accuse me of writing poison pen letters to Claire. He can? On what evidence? The word of a medium? According to Linville himself, Claire had the notes checked with a handwriting expert who swore that the handwriting was mine. Now, how does that point to you? Why can't you leave me alone? Oh, come, Jason... You were having a ball with the notes and watching the effect they had on Claire? All right, I'll admit that, but writing nasty little notes is a lot different than killing. Well, of course it is. And you want me to guarantee that no one will ever connect you with the killing. That's what you really want, isn't it, Jason? <sighs> Look, you're too smug for me to argue with. There's no point in any further discussion, so... Well, now, hold on a minute, Jason, hold on. I want to tell you how I can guarantee your being in the clear. Like promising me you won't give the police my name. I offer you complete safety. How? A suicide note. Suicide? Exactly. Claire will commit suicide. Take an overdose of sleeping pills and leave a completely authentic suicide note to prove it. You mean you're really going to drive Claire to suicide? Don't you think Claire is the suicidal type? No. I agree. That's why we must have the note. Do you want to write it now? Are you out of your mind? Just write what I dictate. No way. We are going to say that she just couldn't stand the idea of betraying me and breaking her solemn marriage vow. Now, you're not going to mention me, are you? Well, of course not. Somebody will remember that the earlier notes dealt with me in Linville. That's why we'll just stick with her guilt about betraying me. You see how careful I'm being about involving you? Yes, but you want me to write the note. You must. I guarantee the handwriting experts will all swear the handwriting is genuine. In addition, it will be on her special stationery, of course. Mm -hmm. And how are you going to arrange that? You are. You are going to be invited to a party. A bash that Claire will be giving next week. And while you're there, I'll arrange to show you the room where Claire keeps her stationery. And the desk. Oh, forget it. Haven't you ever heard of fingerprints? Mine will be all over the place. Pick it up, Jason. That's Claire calling with your invitation. Congratulations, Jason. You accepted Claire's invitation with just the right amount of reluctance. How did you know that Claire would call? Oh, you must grant me certain ghostly secrets of the trade. It should reassure you about our chances of pulling off a successful murder. I thought you said suicide. Yes, I did. But to be quite accurate, I should have said apparent suicide. We both agreed that Claire wasn't the suicidal type. Then what was all that talk about sleeping pills in a suicide note? Just talk? By no means. Well, she's not going to take an overdose of her own free will. That is where you come in, Jason. You'll have to see to it that she takes them. We'll work that out somehow. The devil we will. This is where I get off, Peter. I'm finishing with you once and for all, even if I have to smash the set. We're past that, Jason, old boy. What? Wait a minute. The set's off. I hear you. Why can't I see you? Of course the set is off, Jason. But now we have such a close relationship that I don't have to depend on a mechanical device to communicate with you. From now on, Jason, I'm your friend and faithful companion. <laughs> Who was it who first said, with a friend like that, who needs enemies? Oh, well, it really doesn't matter. What matters is that a ghostly voice has taken control of Jason Phillips. All of us are driven sometimes by forces we don't clearly see or understand. But how many of you have ever obeyed the commands of a ghost? And what happened when you did? Don't answer that. Some beer drinkers have funny ideas about beer. They think beer improves with age, like wine. Well, find a brewmaster, though. 
you'll find a beer drinker who knows better. The Budweiser Brewmaster says it all depends on how beer is aged. Just letting beer sit in lagering tanks makes it older, not necessarily better. That even goes for keeping a case around the house for a couple of months. But there is one kind of aging that's good for beer. The Budweiser kind. Beechwood aging. In this kind of aging, something happens. It lets all the flavor of the choicest hops and best barley malt that go into Budweiser get through to you. Sure, it takes more time and trouble to brew Budweiser that way. But brewing beer right does make a difference. Anheuser-Busch, St. Louis. Eyeglasswearers, why buy glasses without a guarantee? Especially the kind of guarantee you get at the 15 Hillman Cohan Vision Centers in New Jersey. It's a unique you bust them, we fix them guarantee, and it comes with every pair of glasses they dispense. If they break, take back the pieces and they'll fix or replace them unconditionally for one whole year. Who else gives you such a guarantee? And such an unbelievable selection. Hillman Cohan Vision Center. Everything for everybody who wears or buys eyeglasses. Including complete one-hour service for most glasses. Satisfaction assured. No wonder Vision Center is growing so fast. Check out the one nearest you. They're all open daily, 10 to 9, Saturdays till 5. Put on a happy face at your Vision Center. Get one-hour service in the Great Eyeglass Guarantee at two Hillman Cohan Vision Centers in Wayne, Route 46, opposite Willowbrook, and in Wayne Hills Mall, Hamburg Turnpike. Bank AmeriCard and Master Charge accepted. When you have to make a lot of short business flights, there's not much glamour left to it. All you want is to get there on time as conveniently and comfortably as possible. That's why TWA developed Ambassador Express. If you're a little late getting to the airport, you can get your ticket right in the gate area. Then you can carry your suitcase on board with you because TWA has big carry-on luggage compartments on more planes than any other airline. In coach, the TWA twin seat lets you fold down the middle seat if nobody's there and sit a comfortable two across instead of three. And we've set up our schedules with convenient return flights so you can usually fly out in the morning and back home again that same evening. TWA's Ambassador Express. It's a business-like approach to flying on business. TWA has 44 Ambassador Express non-city city Pittsburgh and Indianapolis every business day. Call your travel agent or TWA. People who hear voices either tell no one or lay themselves open to all sorts of risks, not the least of which is ending up on a couch. Actor Jason Phillips has been hearing the same voice for weeks, the voice of a Broadway producer who keeps urging Jason to kill the producer's actress wife. Jason is now disturbed enough to seek help from a distinguished and brilliant psychiatrist. The whole purpose of our talks, Jason, depends on your deciding what is important. Now, obviously, your losing the part in Cries of Descent was a real shock to you. Well, it would be to anybody. Of course, but what about Claire Truro? What was your relationship with her before that? It was friendly, casual. I mean, after all, she was Peter's wife, and he made no bones about how he felt about her. Were you attracted to her? She's a very good-looking woman. That's not what I asked. Oh, I guess maybe, but nothing earth-shaking. And how did she feel about you? I don't know. I mean, I... I think it might be wise if you could recreate the day she told you she was replacing you in cries of dissent. Well, I don't know if I can remember all of it. I, uh, I came to the theater that day about the same time as usual... Rehearsal was scheduled for 11. I got there about 10.50. I was sitting in my dressing room when I heard a knock on the door. Come in. I'm glad you're early, Jason. There's something I want to talk to you about. Fine. Well, I need the script. No. Jason, darling, this isn't going to be very pleasant. Well, the last few weeks haven't been very pleasant. This is something I know is going to hurt you, and I wish... How I wish... You're not making sense. I've never done this before. I've never fired an actor before. Fired an actor? 
You mean I'm out of the play? I'm afraid so. But why? Why? You know I'm good in the part. You know what the part means to me. Why would... I think you're beginning to understand. Believe me, Jason, I... Does Linville mean that much to you? Well, you knew I... I knew you were seeing a lot of him, but I didn't think that... Well, isn't this very sudden? Peter's only been dead a few days. Edward Linville and I... Well, we go back a long way. Claire, I don't want to hear any stories of old love affairs. It's not going to make me feel any differently about the kind of deal you're giving me. I don't suppose I could expect you to feel any other way. Come off it, Claire. You cut my heart out and you want to be forgiven? You'll get your full salary for the run of the I don't play. need it. I'll take my two weeks' notice. I'll be in touch with your agent. Goodbye, Jason. And that's about the way it was, Doctor. Oh, a traumatic experience. It has left a deep scar. Well, I knew that before I came to you. Now, help me. Well, the help must come from within you. You don't believe in this ghost of mine. Do you? We keep going around in circles, Doctor. Not quite. The first day you came to me, you wanted to know whether or not you could actually hear a voice and be perfectly sane. You remember I gave you an answer. Yes, you said it was possible. And then? Then I told you the voice I heard belonged to a dead man and asked if you believed in ghosts. And do you remember my answer? Yes, you said, for some people, ghosts are a way of life. That's right. Doesn't that apply to you? No, and I don't know anyone it does apply to. Doctor, if you're trying to confuse me, you're doing a great job. I'm trying to lead you to a conclusion. You'd only kill someone who did you harm... Does that seem so strange? Someone like Claire Truro? Well, there you go again, Doctor, trying to prove something. Prove what? That I'd really like to kill Claire. Wouldn't you? Yes. Yes, I would. I'd like to get my hands around her throat. Yes, I want to kill her. What in the world have you done, Jason? Made a purchase, Peter. A mannequin. Don't you recognize her? Should I? Well, she's a lady very close to your heart. To me, she just looks like any other window dummy they use in dress shops. Ah, but this one is different, Peter. Don't you recognize your beloved wife, Claire? What kind of foolishness is this? Expensive made-to-order therapy for a man who talks to ghosts. A ghost who wants him to kill his wife. Now, I prop Claire up here in the corner of this couch, and I hit her. And I hear again, and again, and again. You feel better? Much better, Peter. You see, I'm willing to admit to you now that I am aggressive towards Claire, and I would like to see her dead. That is progress. That's what my doctor says. Now that I've admitted the terrible thought and acknowledged it, I can get rid of my aggression. By hitting that department store dummy on the head? You go ahead and laugh. But it's going to work. Jason? Jason, over here. Oh, great party, Claire. <laughs> Thank you, Jason. I want you and Edward to shake hands right here now. Of course. Go on, Edward. Go on, shake hands. Well, I think I made a fool of myself, Jason. Well, you don't have a monopoly on foolishness. I kind of lost my head, too. Well, it's all over now. And even though Edward said I shouldn't, I have to ask a favor, Jason. Go right ahead. Well, you know that little church around the corner from your apartment? You mean St. Anthony's? Mm -hmm, that's it. They have a theatrical about this time every year, and I've known Father Kinsolving for years and years, and... Well, I... I always donate some costumes, and I was wondering if you'd be kind enough to drop them off for me. No trouble at all. I'd be happy to. You see, Edward, what you called my silly brainstorm turned out to be not such a bad idea at all. <laughs> Welcome home, Jason. Did you enjoy the party? Matter of fact, I had a ball. I see you have the clothes with which you can dress that ridiculous dummy, so it looks even more like Claire. These are costumes that I have to give to St. Anthony's. Well, try one of them on the dummy. You'll find it will make your therapy more effective. Go on. I like that blue dress. Wait a minute. Did you have anything to do with this? Of course I put the idea into Claire's head of asking you to deliver the costumes. I think it's going to please me to see a more lifelike Claire in your living room and give you a good deal more of satisfaction. 
All right, Doctor, I'll admit I do feel better. But all that pummeling and smashing at the model of Claire hasn't stopped me from hearing Peter's voice. Do you also see him? Only when I turn on the TV. I don't bother with that anymore. But I am still confused. You and I have these long conversations and... You were about to say... Well, I don't know. I, um... There are too many things that can't be explained away because of my aggressiveness. Those notes and the fact that they were judged to be in Peter's handwriting. Which you've often seen enough on checks and letters. I'm not that good a forger. All right, Jason. What is the alternative? I don't understand. We've come a long way since you first came here. Let's assume that you didn't forge the notes. You know who wrote them, but someone else dictated them. And the same person guided your hand. Now... Who could that person possibly be? I've been telling you, the ghost of Peter Truro. And this same ghost influenced his wife to give you costumes to deliver to a church for a theatrical. He says he did. This, then, is the alternative you must face. That there is a ghost. That he is the ghost of Peter Truro. And that he is haunting you. And that I believe in that ghost? Don't you? I'm afraid I don't have any choice. Who is it? Alida. Oh, come in. Thank you for coming so soon after I called. I'd never forgive myself if I hadn't. Who's that? It's just a dummy dressed in Claire's clothes. You must get rid of it. Well, I will, but I asked you to visit with me. Get rid of it now. What do you want me to do, throw it out the window? It doesn't matter. Don't you realize how dangerous it is for you to have her here? Oh, come on, Alita. It was my doctor's idea. He said I could use the dummy to take out my aggression. Indeed. And where did you get the clothes? Claire gave them to me. Does she know how you're using them? She gave me a lot of stuff to give to a church theatrical. I kept this one dress out. Are you so friendly that she would ask you to do her a favor like that? Look, I'm afraid I've gone as far as I can with the doctor. He feels that it's all my subconscious. My urge to kill Claire that accounts for everything. Your wish to kill Claire does not mean there are no ghosts. There is evil all around you. Either you or Claire must leave New York. I don't see how running away will get rid of Peter. I'm not so much concerned now with your getting rid of Peter as I am with saving your life. You really mean that, don't you? You're really frightened. There was only one other time in my life when I've been this frightened. When was that? No. No. Now, Jason, please come away with me. Come back with me to Clarkstown until... Until? Until the restless thirst for revenge has left the ghost of Peter Truro. You were sensational tonight, Claire, my love. Thank you, Edward. Shall we eat something before we go home? No, no, I'll meet you at the house. I have to go someplace first. Oh, very mysterious. Well, it, it, it's important. You care to tell me? I'm afraid you disapprove. Well, if it's what I think it is, I certainly will do more than disapprove. Oh, be a darling and don't ask any questions. I'll tell you all about it when I get home. Now, Claire, I'm not going... I have to get this makeup off and I... You're not going. Now, don't be silly, Edward. You don't even know where I'm going. Stop treating me like a child, Claire. It's obvious that you're taking that last note seriously. I want these notes to end. I want this whole situation to end. Can you promise me that you can stop it, Edward? No, but... But this last note says I'll have all the answers if I go alone to Jason's apartment. And you believe that? It also says I'll find the door open. I'm going there. And if the door's open, I'll go in. But, Claire... You you know where I'll be. And if I'm not home in an hour, you can come after me. Call the police or do anything you want. Darn, I just remembered something, Alita. What? I left something important in the apartment. Oh, but Jason, our bus leaves in half an hour. You promised to go home with me. There's plenty of time. My apartment's only a short distance. I'll grab a cab, be back in plenty of time. Meet you at gate number five. You're doing the right thing, Jason. I promise a stunning surprise awaits you in your apartment. And after tonight, it will be all over. Cab! You'll like what I've done with the mannequin, Jason. That's a promise. That part of the note is right. Jason? Jason, are you home? Oh, darn. Oh, 
What are the lights? Oh! oh. What's this? Jason, you're not playing some silly game, are you? Oh. oh. A dummy. Some kind of store figure. Jason, whatever you're up to, get this thing away from me. It's just where a dummy belongs. On the floor. Jason, I'm too old to be afraid of the dark. I'll, I'll just sit and wait for you. And if you don't come soon, Edward will be here. I'm warning you. Oh, I thought mentioning Edward would do it. Switch on the light, Jason. <laughs> oh, Peter, this is what your surprise is. You've made the mannequin talk. Marvelous, Peter. Who are you talking to, Jason? <laughs> Please turn on the light. Thank you, Peter. This is really wonderful. <laughs> Jason! Are you mad? And the truth feels like real flesh. My hands are closing around real flesh. I don't know how you did it, Peter. Jason, you're killing me. Jason, stop. <laughs> that. Finishes you once and for all. Now, a little light. Clear. Clear. It's really clear. Of course, Jason. I've kept my promise and you've done the job. Now you're rid of me forever. Goodbye, Jason. Clear. Claire, I've really killed you. No. No. Oh, no. Well, that's one way to rid yourself of a ghost. Jason Phillips was no longer haunted. However, I certainly don't recommend it, the rule. I do recommend, however, a more generous system of disbelief. One tells you he's hearing voices... He can't explain. I want that sinus medicine. Headache tablets? No, sinus medicine. Sinus tablets. Helps the headache and the pressure. Oh, you mean sign off. Exactly. Headache pain is one thing. A sinus headache is something else. Sometimes your whole face can seem to throb with pain. You want relief. Take sign off tablets. S I N E O F F. The sinus medicine that gives you a full dose of pure aspirin plus a sinus drainer. Sign off. The sinus medicine that helps relieve sinus pain while you drain. And sign off doesn't stop there. Have you tried sign off sinus spray? The fastest known form of sinus congestion relief. It works in seconds. That's sign off sinus spray. When sinus flares up, use sign off tablets and spray only as directed. S I N E O F F. Sign off. Exactly. Sign off. The sinus medicines in the bright red box. And now, another story of the ball and chain, as Kellogg's Special K presents The Library. Welcome to the public library. May I help you, sir? Uh, yes, I'd like to check out... Uh, I'd like to check out Famous Laundromats of the World by Audrey Schnorbart. Sir, excuse me, but isn't that ball and chain you're wearing just like the ones they use in the Kellogg's Special K commercial? Uh, this ball and chain? Yes, that one. How are you going to get rid of it? Well, you know, lots of good exercises. And by eating smart at every meal, starting with the Special K breakfast. Don't you have to watch your calories? Yes, and the Special K breakfast is less than 240 calories. Less than 240 calories? Shh, right. A one-ounce bowl of high-protein Special K, four ounces of skim milk, tomato juice, and coffee. It's really tasty, and it's going to help me get rid of this ball and chain. I'd say it's <laughs> long overdue, get it? <laughs> your happy ending could begin with the Special K breakfast from Kellogg's. Commuting. We're big on that. Time is money in the business world. That's why Ozark offers commuter flights that get you there and back the same day. Don't ever let a few hundred miles stand between you and big business opportunities. If you're long on work but short on time, let Ozark make your day pay off. Commuting, we're big on that. Go Ozark Jet to Champaign-Urbana, Peoria, and Springfield, Illinois. Call Ozark or your travel agent. Our cast included Mandel Kramer, Ralph Bell, E.V. Jester, and Bob Caliban. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown.
Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division, the Kellogg Company, makers of Kellogg Special K cereal, and new sugar-free diet 7-Up. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. The W.R. Mystery Theater has been brought to you by ShopRite Supermarkets, where you get a lot more for a little less, and by Suburban Savings with offices throughout North Jersey. The preceding Mystery Theater program is furnished by the CBS Radio Network. I'm Fulton Lewis in the Mutual Broadcasting System studios in Washington, D.C. Now, my commentary. Well, it's getting so you may need a program to follow the players. In the past few days, some Republican congressional leaders have called on President Nixon to step down from office rather than to face the impeachment process in the House of Representatives and perhaps later the Senate. Today, Democratic leaders said that President Nixon should not shortcut that impeachment process by resigning. They also added that Republicans who have been calling on him to resign are worried about their own future. The note in what appears to be a growing party consensus was sounded by participants in a high-level breakfast at which House Speaker Carl Albert was the host. Speaking with newsmen afterward, Albert reaffirmed his own opposition to resignation in shorter terms than he has yet used, saying it would be disastrous for the president to resign under political pressure. Albert added, if he is not guilty and those facts come out, he would be exonerated. But if he resigns and later it is shown that he was not guilty, it would result in irreparable harm to our country and our political system. Albert added that he is certain that the president is not going to resign. Meanwhile, Democratic National Committee Chairman Robert Strauss praised leaders of his party for what he called remarkable restraint in what obviously has to be an issue with partisan overtones. In contrast, he said, there is a terrible hue and cry by Republicans running for office around the country trying to put great distance between themselves and President Nixon. For this reason, Strauss added, Democratic leaders have to step forward and express themselves, calling not for resignation, but calling instead for White House cooperation and making information available to speed the impeachment inquiry. Representative Thomas Tip O'Neill of Massachusetts, the House Democratic leader, said that he at one time publicly expressed the opinion that the president's resignation would be good for the country, But he said circumstances have now changed his mind. O'Neill said, I think now that Americans want all the facts to come out, not only for now, but for posterity and for history. Kentucky Governor Wendell Ford, the chairman of the Democratic Governors Conference, said that he has expressed no opinion on the impeachment process because he is seeking the Senate seat held by Republican Marlo Cook, and so he might conceivably become a juror in the impeachment process. Ford said, Senator Cook and others who asked the president to resign create the impression that they are trying to put some distance between themselves and the president. Also attending today's breakfast were Senate Democrat Leader Mike Mansfield of Montana and Senate Democrat Whip Robert Byrd of West Virginia, both of whom said yesterday that the president should not resign. Meanwhile, Senate Republican Leader Hugh Scott also said today he opposes presidential resignation. Scott commented, I think our nation is strong enough to withstand the functioning of its own constitution. The Judiciary Committee met in closed session today for a background briefing on impeachment evidence and also to listen to White House tapes. And White House lawyer James St. Clair reported, uh, would reportedly planned to present a document to the committee outlining the president's position on future subpoenas that the panel might consider issuing during its impeachment probe. The first order of business today at a committee session that was scheduled, uh, has been scheduled for tomorrow morning is going to be a vote on whether to subpoena additional material from the White House. Exactly what material is not yet known. The morning session today was devoted to a briefing on impeachment evidence. This afternoon, the committee members listened to various White House tapes. Before going into this afternoon's session, California Republican Representative Charles Wiggins said, that he understood presidential attorney St. Clair has a document for the committee bearing on the subpoena process. Wiggins said that he did not know what sort of argument St. Clair planned to present. California Democrat Representative Jerome Waldy, the only committee member who had any comment when the meeting broke up for lunch, said, nothing we heard today has not been heard before by the public. 
Wally said he understood the afternoon would be devoted to listening to tapes, starting with a recording of a June 20th, 1972 conversation that was held between the president and former White House Chief of Staff H.R. Haldeman. That, of course, is the now-famous tape with the 18-and-a-half-minute gap, which a panel of experts has concluded was caused by between five and nine separate erasures. The experts' final report on the gap is due to be released by U.S. District Court Judge John Sirica later this month. Today's meeting was the second closed session by the committee to hear the evidence that its impeachment staff has gathered by about President Nixon's Watergate role. The first session was held last Thursday afternoon. This initial phase of the evidence presentation is being devoted exclusively to the Watergate break-in and to the alleged cover-up that occurred uh, subsequently. Later presentations are going to cover such areas as the activities of the White House Plumbers Unit, the President's personal finances and his tax problems, the ITT antitrust settlement and political contributions from the dairy industry. Representative Waldy, who was opposed closing these sessions to the press and to the public, said that the committee had heard no information so far that would in the slightest defame or degrade anyone. He was referring to a rule of the House of Representatives that requires closed sessions in cases where defamatory or degrading information was being presented. Congressman Waldy added it was a monotonous session. The committee met amid renewed word from the White House that there is absolutely no chance that President Nixon is going to leave office voluntarily. The committee members went into the closed session carrying the thick, loose-leafed index books that they received last week from the committee staff. From the Mutual Studios in Washington, I'm Fulton Lewis, and that's the top of the news as it looks from here.